so delighted to be here tonight and to talk with you a little bit about the work that we're doing at the Trust and to share with you some of the highlights of uh, my new book, The Past and Future City. I like saying my new book because it implies there's an old book, which there actually isn't. That's my only book. But I'm really, I'm really happy to talk with you tonight um, and to be part of this 25th anniversary Congress. So a quarter century ago when Andres Duani and Elizabeth Plater Zyberg they brought architects and builders and scholars together in Alexandria to promote a better vision for our cities. A vision, as you know, to reduce sprawl and revitalize main streets that emphasized health and well-being, walkability and sustainability, and that worked to bring the built environment back to a human scale, to forge neighborhoods that were built for people and not cars. The charter for the new urbanism encapsulates their vision and your vision, and as Kevin Daniels was saying just a few minutes ago, also expresses our sense of mission at the National Trust and our desire to help cities flourish through revitalization. So for 25 years now, CNU has been at the forefront of this movement, and we at the National Trust look to you for inspiration and leadership and as allies. You've galvanized architects and developers to transform our cities for the better, often by returning them to the qualities that made them so beloved in the first place. The legacy projects that we just heard about testify to that spirit of innovation and creativity that you've all nurtured here. And I, I just want to say thank you for the work that you do. We all benefit from it. So I know in many ways I'm preaching to the choir this evening. But it's sometimes taken a while for, and I'd, I'd say longer than it, ha than it should have, for preservationists and urbanists to realize that we're arms of the same movement, sharing the same vision and the same goals. And preservation in particular has had a bad reputation in some corners, and I would say, you know, deservedly so, for being the movement of no, the people who tell you what you can't do, but the fact of the matter is that preservation is one of the most powerful tools for urban regeneration that we have. Reusing older buildings creates jobs, and it reinvigorates local economies, and helps small businesses come to life. It can help our neighborhoods be healthier and more sustainable, and it can help us grapple with many of the most intransigent urban problems we have today, like affordability and displacement, sustainability, and climate change and it can bring communities together. So this evening, I'm going to try to make that case to all of you through the stories of some remarkable men and women who've shaped the past, the present, and the future of the preservation movement. And I'm going to start with a woman that you all know very well, the intellectual founder of both of our movements, the one and only Jane Jacobs who of course was a journalist and an activist with no formal training in urban planning, but she was a keen observer of the world around her. She cut a really fierce figure with her trademark cat eye glasses and her no-nonsense bob, and she was, by all accounts, fearless. Just take a listen. The kind of planning that we ought to have should not be planning that begins with what is nasty here, what do we take out, but rather, what is missing here? Which of the conditions that are needed to make this a lively and convenient place that works? Why, for instance, weren't people walking in the areas that uh, all the artist conceptions had shown full of happy promenaders? They weren't there. Happy promenaders. Now, her, her candor angered a lot of people, and no one more so than her principal antagonist and an unstoppable force in his own right, New York City's master builder, Robert Moses, who over the course of his career built more than 600 miles of highway, 13 bridges and two tunnels in New York. And Moses believed, as, as you all know, that cities are created by and for traffic. And to accomplish his vision, he often ripped out entire blocks of, of neighborhoods. But Jane Jacobs observed a different rhythm of the city, what she called the sidewalk ballet. She believed that cities are created by and for people. So when Robert Moses tried to, to tear down her block or run expressways through lower Manhattan neighborhoods, she helped form and uh, lead community coalitions to stop him. 
Now, she didn't win every battle. She was among those who tried and failed to save New York's Penn Station. But she won more than she lost. And over the years of fighting against her nemesis, she helped articulate and then promote a vision that put front and center the many benefits that older places bring to cities. In her most famous book, and she did write more than one, The Death and Life of Great American Cities, she argued that older buildings are critical and necessary feature of thriving neighborhoods. She wrote, and I, I quote, that cities need old buildings so badly it's probably impossible for vigorous streets and districts to grow without them. They provide character and ensure mixed use. They offer space for entrepreneurs, local businesses, artists, and innovators. And today, more than a half century after she wrote those words, we now have the tools to put her theory to the test. Three years ago, our Preservation Green Lab at the National Trust published a report that we called Older, Smaller, Better. And it evaluated the age, the diversity, and size of all buildings, not just historic buildings, in three cities, in Washington, D.C., in San Francisco, and right here in Seattle. And using GIS mapping technology and innovative data sources like cell phone usage patterns, we examined how each block in these cities performed according to different economic, social, cultural, and environmental performance metrics. And what we found is exactly what Jane Jacobs predicted. That neighborhoods with a mix of older and, new build, uh, older and newer buildings tend to have more small business jobs and more diversity in housing costs meaning more opportunities for families of all incomes. They have hidden density, meaning more people and, and businesses per commercial square foot than areas with just new buildings. They're more walkable and have more creative jobs. They have more new and women and minority-owned businesses, and they have more non-chain businesses. They show more activity on evenings and weekends, this is a map of cell phone activity on a Friday night in Seattle. And you thought it was just the NSA who was tracking where you are with your cell phones, but it's, now you know it's the National Trust for Historic Preservation. So we now have the empirical data to back up Jane Jacobs' assertions. And since publishing Older, Smaller, Better, we've since documented the same benefits all across America. This past November, we released a, a new report that we're calling the Atlas of Re-Urbanism. And yes, we chose that name as an homage to the work that you all have been doing all these years. So in fact, if you go online to atlasofreurbanism.com, you can see the principles of reurbanism that we've drafted that are inspired by your charter. The Atlas of Reurbanism applies that same methodology that we used in Older, Smaller, Better and applies it to 50 cities across the country and you can see them here on the slide behind me. And once again, what we found is quite remarkable. In each one of these 50 cities, when compared to areas with just new buildings, the areas with a mix of old and new buildings have 33% more new business jobs and 46% more small business jobs. These older areas have 60% more women and minority-owned businesses, and more diverse populations in general. In fact, 75% of Americans of color live in these older areas. There are 27% more affordable housing units than in new areas. And in every city in the Atlas, there's greater population density, and greater density of housing units on blocks with older, smaller, mixed-aged buildings. So we're really excited about what we're seeing and because we can now prove that preservation is the path to a brighter urban future. Now, one case that I know particularly well is Denver, Colorado, because I grew up in Denver, about 70 miles north in a town called Loveland, and Denver was my first big city. And today, as you all un um, undoubtedly know, Denver is a national leader in almost every way that counts. Its population has been growing at double the national rate. Its unemployment is hovering at around 2.5%. And thanks to its you know, 
really thoughtful infrastructure. It continually ranks as one of America's fittest cities. So how has Denver become such an urban powerhouse? Well, one reason, a big, really big part of their success, is another fearless woman named Dana Crawford. Here she is. I don't know whether it's genetic or not, but I'm attracted to um, beautiful places. And a lot of times, they happen to be places that have become ignored. When I go around the country on consulting jobs and I get to the towns, I always say, take me to your pigeons and your pensioners, and then I find the beautiful buildings. So Dana began her work in the Larimer Square neighborhood of Denver, which at the time was a pretty scary and, and down at the heels part of the city. As with so many other quote unquote urban renewal plans of the 1960s, Denver was trying to revitalize its downtown by tearing it down. Already nearly 30 blocks of the historic downtown had been destroyed. Keep your eye on the bell tower on this slide uh, behind me. So this is Denver's downtown before urban renewal. And here it is afterwards. Now Larimer Square is in the upper right hand corner. And it's one of the few places that survived the wrecking ball. And that's because Dana had a very different vision. She believed that people would rather live in a city that, that kept its historic character. Here she is again. Well, I've been looking for quite some time since I had moved to Denver for an area where I might um, bring the affection that I had developed for the city of Boston to Denver, a place where we could mark um, the history of the community and would be a wonderful gathering place for a lot of people from all walks of life, all incomes and, and all backgrounds. So. Then when I was shopping at Goodwill Industries on Larimer Street, I did drive by the 1400 block and I was quite fascinated by the architecture. So then I began to do research about it and found that it was in fact the block where everything started. So with her friends and neighborhoods, she began buying the older buildings along the 1400 block of Larimer Square, uh, which you see there, often for little more than the price of the land they were on. Now you can tell by listening to her that she's a very dynamic woman. And by 1965, her company had acquired most of the 1400 block. To give you an idea of how Dana operates, she um, announced a press conference to have the mayor come and endorse her vision. And Several days later, she invited the mayor to come. <laughs> so Dana will tell you it's, it wasn't always an easy lift. The banks thought she was crazy, but her instincts were spot on. And by the 1980s, Larimer Square was really on its way back and a powerful example of what could be accomplished elsewhere in Denver. Building on that example, and with important advocacy and assistance from our Denver field office, the city... I don't think that's me, but maybe it is. The city then uh, worked to create a lower downtown historic district, and lightning struck twice. Today, Lodo, lower downtown as it's known, is considered the heart of the city with the lowest commercial vacancy rates around. Union Station, which is one of Dana's recent projects, has been a centerpiece of uh, Lodo's revitalization. And yes, she is still going strong at the age of 85. Now, one of the many business owners who flocked to the downtown area was John Hickenlooper. Before he was Denver's mayor, and of course, now he's Colorado's governor, he opened a brewery in Lodo with several of his friends. They bought space in the historic Mercantile Building in 1988 for just $6 a foot. And within uh, 10 years, their investment was already worth 100 times that. Today, that same preservation-minded neighborhood is, uh, spirit is remaking Denver neighborhoods like Capitol Hill, Uptown, Highland, and River North. And we now have the tools and the data to replicate Denver's success all over America. And I think we have an amazing opportunity because preservation isn't just about grand mansions. It can benefit almost every neighborhood. No matter how modest, every community has places that define them and stories to tell. And every city's future is connected to its past. And of course, right now, 
the largest and most diverse generation in American history is leading a drive back into cities. And one of the main reasons they're coming back are historic buildings. As one young engineer in Baltimore said to me, people want a lot more authenticity in what they wear, in what they eat, and in where they live. Or in the words of Ann Olson, our, our partner in the Buffalo Bayou Partnership in Houston, Texas, they come for the quality of life, the quality of life that older places can provide. And research bears this out. In 2014, Sasaki and Associates conducted a survey in six cities, uh, Austin, Boston, Chicago, New York, San Francisco, and Washington, D.C., to ask what exactly residents loved about the places where they lived. And they were surprised to discover that one of the most popular answers was historic buildings. Nearly two-thirds of the city residents that they surveyed said that they would stop and admire historic buildings while walking around, far more than said the same thing about modern buildings or skyscrapers. And when asked how firms like theirs could better improve the city's character, the most popular answer by far was renovate existing historic buildings to retain their character while making them more usable. By contrast, fewer than one in five felt like their city was too quaint or that they really wanted more uh, modern buildings. Now these, these findings align with other studies. A 2007 Gallup poll on urban life found that the between happiness and those people who believe that they live in a beautiful place. So many people, of course, have noted the connection between landscape and beauty in our landscape. As Arthur, uh, author Stuart Brand put it, something strange happens when a building turns uh, when, it, when a building ages past a certain um, age, a, a human generation or two, any building more than 100 years will be considered beautiful no matter what. And in fact, one of the ironies of, of our work in preservation today is that we're now fighting to save some of the idiosyncratic, modern and brutalist buildings that were considered eye, um, eyesores just uh, not so long ago. And there are so many ways that cities can leverage their historic buildings. Among them, tools like flexible form-based zoning codes that allow for mixed use and revising parking requirements to encourage walkable communities and street life. Reuse ordinances and, out and output-focused energy codes that make it easier to reuse old buildings. I could go on in detail, but I would just be telling you what you already know because CNU has been the pioneer and the champion of so many of these smart public policies uh, for a very long time. But they all underscore all our central premise that building reuse should be the standard in our cities and that demolition should always be the option of last resort. And above all else, thank you. And above all else, that we should be reusing our older buildings so that they're meeting the needs of today's citizens. These buildings don't need to be trapped in amber or sequestered behind velvet ropes. They really need to be centers of 21st century community. Some of the most exciting projects that I see when I'm traveling around the country are when theaters become churches and churches become restaurants, warehouses become art spaces, uh, hotels become affordable housing and senior living. And at scale, these transformations really add up. To give you one particularly striking example, consider Los Angeles, the stereotypical highway city. And I was just there on Monday, and there's still a lot of driving in Los Angeles. But through preservation, downtown Los Angeles is changing. 17 years ago, there was a partnership between neighborhood groups, city leaders, developers, and preservationists that led to an adaptive reuse ordinance. And it removed regulatory barriers like burdensome parking requirements that help make it possible to repurpose more than 60 historic buildings as apartments, lofts, and hotels. Many of them were early 20th century buildings which had sat vacant for decades. And as a result, the population in these neighborhoods tripled. And downtown Los Angeles is now a thriving hub of residential and uh, commercial 
enterprise with an astonishing 14,000 new housing units in older buildings. And I like to think that if it can happen in LA, it can happen anywhere in the United States. And it's important to keep in mind, and I want to underscore, that preservation can benefit everyone. It's not just about the millennials and the empty nesters. Which leads me to my third heroine tonight. Let me tell you about M. Tamanika Youngblood, yet another fearless woman who helped revitalize her neighborhood through preservation. Here's M. Tamanika in her own words. In terms of ensuring that residents are involved in the planning, in the um, development, and ob obviously at the end of the day, in living in these houses is, is our specific focus. While we want to attract others to the community and to the neighborhood, obviously for um, a, a greater mix of incomes, which is our, our, our stated goal and intention, we are very focused on making certain that we improve this neighborhood for the benefit of those residents who are there and who have been there for the long term. So in the early 1990s, M. Tamanika and her husband bought a house in the Sweet Auburn area of Atlanta's Old Fourth Ward. You may know that Sweet Auburn was once known as the most prosperous African-American business district in the world. It's where Martin Luther King grew up, where he led his flock, and where he and Coretta Scott King are now buried. But it fell on hard times over the years. In fact, soon after M. Tamanika moved in, she saw a bus of foreign tourists who were, who were coming to visit the, the King history there. And she described later that they had this look of horror on their face. She said they looked as if they were in the Wild West. So M. Tamanika turned to one of her neighbors and she said, we have to do something. This just isn't who we are. And so she did. She became the executive director of an organization called the Historic District Development uh, Corporation, to, and they preserve and revitalize the sweet Auburn uh, area and Auburn Avenue. She worked with banks and developers and community agencies to renovate historic homes throughout the neighborhood and to build compatible infill homes on nearby vacant lots. Now, all told, HDDC has redeveloped or preserved 110 single-family homes, constructed nearly 500 units of multifamily housing, and added more than 40,000 square feet of commercial space in the old fourth ward. And through this, they've revitalized Sweet Auburn and they've created affordable housing units for a range of, of incomes without displacing a single existing family. And today, M. M. Tamanika is applying the same principles of preservation and adaptive reuse to drive renewed commercial growth along Auburn Avenue, which you can see here on the slide. And her, I, I, her good work, I think, is just so important, and it demonstrates to me how history, sustainability, fairness, and economic vitality can all go hand in hand. And it's, it's not just a one-off singular story. There, there are similar things happening all across the country. In Houston, artist Rick Lowe has worked to renovate and transform 22 houses in the old Third Ward to better meet the, meet, uh, meet the needs of that neighborhood. His work has revitalized this historic area of Houston, and he's since brought the same model, fusing historic preservation, art, community service, and revitalization to North Dallas, and to Watts, and to New Orleans after Katrina. In Macon, Georgia, the historic Macon Foundation has been combining preservation with a number of innovative financing tools to revitalize the, revitalize the Bells Hill neighborhood, which is immediately adjacent to Mercer University. With a total investment of roughly $5 million, which has mostly come from foundations, they'll transform almost 500 buildings in this historic neighborhood. Since they began their efforts, the total property tax revenue in Bells Hill has increased by nearly a million dollars, most of it from rehabbing abandoned houses and building on empty land. Historic Macon also has made it a point to never displace landowners. And they do that um, by never acquiring an occupied house. 
And they're working to counter gentrification in other ways too, like re recruiting low-income homeowners and advocating uh, for property tax freezes. And the result of their work is a diverse and thriving neighborhood where longtime residents and new arrivals alike just rave about the impact of the foundation's work. In chapter six of my book, I go on at, at some length about the issue of affordability and displacement because too often free market economists like to blame preservation for the affordability crisis in the United States. But our research suggests that this just isn't the case. As I mentioned earlier, our, our research shows that neighborhoods with older buildings tend to have more small businesses and diversity in housing costs. And they're also often built for more density, much more so than single family homes. So along with creative infill and altering parking requirements, repurposing historic buildings for housing can help mitigate the housing crisis that we have in the United States. Take Louisville, Kentucky, for example, where we've been doing some work recently. The red spaces on this map of downtown Louisville behind me are surface parking lots. And the purple ones are parking garages. <laughs> so clearly, there's a lot of room here in Louisville to add density without demolishing any more historic fabric. And with more than three parking spaces in America for every one car, I'm sure this holds true for a lot of American, um, other American cities as well. The fact is that in cities big and small, the best preservation projects are creating opportunities for community residents at all income levels while retaining their local history that ties these generations together. The issues of gentrification and displacement are some of the most challenging issues facing our cities today. But there's one that may overtake them both, and that's climate change. And I want to end with this because it's an increasingly frightening problem. And given the current political environment, it's one where cities will increasingly need to take the lead. As we all know, the existence, the very existence of climate change is still being debated in some quarters. But many cities and historic sites across the country just don't have the luxury to talk about it anymore. They're already experiencing and grappling with climate change in very concrete ways. Let me tell you about another woman uh, named Lisa Craig. She's the chief preservation officer for the historic city of Annapolis, Maryland. Along the Atlantic coast, this is the city with the most 18th century structures still standing. Actually, in all of America, they have the most 18th century city uh, buildings. In the early 1960s, Annapolis, Maryland experienced nuisance flooding, which they describe as flooding up to your knees, so it really is quite a nuisance. Um, <laughs> Three days, three days a year in the 1960s. Now this is one of these cities that is uh, subsiding, where it has land subsidence, and the sea levels are also riding, uh, rising. So today, they experience nuisance flooding 30 to 40 days a year. And the trend line's getting worse. By 2030, it's expected to flood every other day. And their climate models show that by 2045, it'll flood every single day in the historic part of Annapolis, which is the slide that you see behind me. Now, Annapolis has as its slogan that they're the sailing capital, but I'm pretty sure this isn't what they had in mind, <laughs> that you could sail right up uh, to the front door of some of these businesses. So working with the mayor and other city leaders, um, environmental scientists, as well as our team at the Preservation Green Lab, Lisa's been helping lead a, a program they call Weather It Together. Uh, preservation efforts in Annapolis, what are they going to do in, this, in the face of, of this reality? Among the solutions that they're working on is raising historic buildings and crafting a larger seawall. But also at the same time, Lisa's part of her job is acclimating residents to the fact that this is their new reality. So the threat's very real, and it's not just Annapolis, of course. Coastal cities all over America are threatened, from New York to Norfolk, Virginia, Miami to the Gulf Coast, and San Diego, right along here to the Puget Sound. To grapple with these transformations, we all know that we need to reduce our carbon footprint as a country, and reusing historic buildings is one of the ways we can do that. In our profession, there's a, a saying that we're, we're fond of, and that is that the greenest building is the one that's already built. 
and it's true because our research has found that it can take decades for even the best new LEED certified buildings to make up the energy and environmental costs of demolition and new construction. In fact, the average 50,000 square foot commercial building embodies the same amount of energy as 640,000 gallons of gasoline. And when a building that could be reused is demolished, all that energy is wasted. Of course, more than just the energy is lost, many older buildings are inherently energy efficient by design. They reflect a wisdom, um, a wisdom that's often been lost of earlier generations that keep these buildings naturally warm in the winter and naturally cool in the summer. In fact, a 2000, in 2003, the Energy Information Administration released a study that said that commercial buildings constructed before 1920 are more energy efficient than buildings constructed any time after. So encouraging building reuse and retrofits is a, a proven effective way to reduce energy costs and mitigate further environmental damage. And if it's done correctly, the impact can really add up. To take just one nearby example, if the city of Portland, Oregon were to retrofit and reuse the single family homes and commercial office buildings that they're otherwise likely to demolish over the next 10 years, they could save about 15% of their sta stated carbon reduction target over the next decade. So that's 15% right off the bat just by conserving and reusing their existing buildings. I argue that I go out of my way to recycle cans and bottles and newspapers, and I know you do too, that we need to be recycling our buildings as well. So moving forward, we at the National Trust look forward to working alongside you um, to help cities unlock these many benefits of of preservation, which I've just touched on tonight, to create jobs and to reduce energy costs, to help us come to terms with difficult chapters of our past, keep our cities affordable, sustainable, healthy, and to make us all happy. Because ultimately, we, we do this work, not for the buildings themselves, but for the people whose lives they make better. People like Aaron Losey, who's a former Marine who recently opened a gym with her brother on H Street in Washington, D.C., and saw it become an immediate success. That historic corridor, which is one of our official main streets, welcomed 250 new businesses and more than 3,000 jobs in just over a decade. Or Elizabeth, a formerly homeless Detroit resident who's found a home in the Michigan Bell Building. Uh, it's an old office complex that's been reconverted into apartments and a resource center for those in need. Elizabeth's now taking GED classes at the Bell so that she can have the skills to get back on her feet. She says that she thanks God every day for this place, that it's a blessing for me, a roof over my head where I have the opportunity to achieve. So older buildings don't just connect us to our past. I believe they're a cornerstone to a brighter future. And, and the best part is that they're right here among us. And we're richer and stronger when they remain. One small change, as we've seen tonight, can set off a ripple that helps to revitalize an entire neighborhood or city. And one person's actions can improve the lives of countless American families. Just look at Jane Jacobs, who stood up against very powerful people to save Lower Manhattan and recalibrated our understanding of what a city should be. She encouraged us to put people first again. Look at Dana Crawford in Atlanta, or Denver, and M. Tominica, Youngblood in Atlanta, Rick Lowe in Houston, and the Historic Macon Foundation, Lisa Craig in Annapolis. Look at Andres Duani and Elizabeth Plater Zyberg. Look at the activists and thinkers who came together 25 years ago in the first ever New Urbanism Congress. I look at tonight's legacy projects and look at the work of so many of you that you're engaged in in your own communities. Together, we're creating the foundation for a better future. We're transforming people's lives and enriching our cities as never before. We, all together, are making a difference. Thank you tonight. Happy silver anniversary to CNU, and here's to many more. Thank you. Thank you.